as for what inspired me to start traveling to these places, um, why well, I, I, I always like traveling anyway, so that's not even the, that wasn't the issue. Um, I actually always wanted to do a series of this nature from when I was young, from when I was, you know, probably her age, <laughs> you know, baby, because this stuff always interests me. African diaspora always interests me, these issues that that um, I cover in the series are prevalent and my family, my parents are from Panama and we, I didn't grow up with the color complex, I didn't know what that was, I didn't know what Pelo Malo was, I didn't know what mejor, Mejorando La Raza was, I didn't know what Mejorando La Raza was until a few years ago because that just wasn't in our family. Nothing negative was attached to our African ancestry, it was celebrated. I, you know, I'm completely opposite. My mother's a little bit darker than me. I wanted to be her color because I said, oh my God, you're so beautiful and look. So it, I didn't have to face that, but I saw it so prevalent that I said, this is something that, or a lot of things that I don't see being addressed and it's really absurd that it's not being addressed. So that's where, where I was coming from with it. Yeah, it's definitely really interesting because I know, like when I learn about sort of like, this um, part of Latin America, this part of um, sort of all of that history, a lot of it is just an emphasis on Trujillo, and that's it. So, and it's more like, like the South American continent is more interesting to me, so <laughs> kind of like getting away from the Caribbean a little bit, I thought that was really cool that you sort of brought it all, all of the Americas instead yeah. of just, because I feel like a lot of that conversation is focused on the Caribbean. Yeah, it is, and the Caribbean, because the Caribbean is such a huge part, and that's where a lot of the first enslaved Africans went, and you have pretty much a, a, I don't even know what to, because it's in this one region that is so much going on, that you said a lot of people do focus on the Caribbean, however, these issues are prevalent in other places, but within their own contextual histories and events and figures, because Trujillo was a, a big character, but then he also, it wasn't just him, and that's only one island, what about the others? So, it is, it is bigger than the Caribbean, it's way bigger than the Caribbean. So, um, with Trujillo, he's one part of the narrative. You know, he, it wasn't just him that he just came in and said, okay, white supremacy. You know, it had to be in place for him to capitalize off of that. So there were other people involved, other ideologies, and I, I will have to add that on an individual and a local level, it's individuals that keep it going because no one, you know, it's no one's telling you to say these things, no one's saying, telling you to say, describe this here as fellow malo or say, oh, if your skin is darker than this, you're bad or this is ugly. This is people of people interaction. So I found that particularly interesting. And the things that their parents say to them, which outside of anything, you know, I, I'm, I mean, I'm not a mother, but it's mind blowing to me that you would think your child anything but perfect. But we have parents saying, oh, you're ugly because of this, because your skin is too dark, because your lips are too big, because your hair is too kinky, blah, blah, blah. And one of the per people I interviewed, Frank, we were discussing that and he said, well, it's very easy to call someone ugly when you don't feel beautiful yourself. So if you hate yourself and you see it on your child, now I hate you too and you look ugly. Not only do I look ugly, you look ugly. And that is the most, that's very psychological. That's very, there's so many layers to this, it's not even funny. You know, I can present one side of it, but it's 500 more underneath. Because if you're calling your child ugly, there's a whole mental <laughs> method with that. So that was the most shocking. Um, in terms of how I interview people, I tend to have a backstory on them personally that I want to address. So for example, Blanca, she, she um, had this story that she found her identity through an, uh, an enslaved Afro-Ecuadorian woman who won her freedom through the courts. 
she was extremely smart. She, just this whole story, which actually her video will be up soon, and their journey through identity. So most of the times they have a specific story and then we branch off of that. Other times, if it's man on the street, obviously I don't know you from Adam, and I'm just gonna ask general questions about racism, about, about identity, and just the, the topics that come up. Pero malo, mejorando la raza. History, is your history taught here in schools? Do you see yourself represented in the media? What's your opinion on this? Do you think this is a problem? Just questions like that where they have to think and reflect. Because a lot of the people I interviewed said that they have never discussed this, A, ever, <laughs> or B, out in the open, or C, outside of this, a few select people, maybe in their family or their circle of friends. So people really open up and tell me a lot of stuff. So I think it's, it's really, it's become easier because I don't know if it, when people, when people see other, when they find out what I'm doing, or if they see an interview, or if I give them background information, they are just like, it's open season. They just say, they, they let it all out. So it's, I really don't have much work to do with the interviewing part. Um, because when you give someone a chance to voice how they really feel, they're, they're gonna speak up. And a lot of people have been speaking up.